left publishing in 1982. I knew pretty much by that time almost exactly what I was going to do. It has always been my desire, my intention to make this a bookstore that is totally devoted to a single subject. Food was a natural. There just aren't very many other people who do this. To this day, uh, I don't know more than 20 worldwide. Not only is it cookbooks, we carry ethnographic monographs, books on food chemistry, books on the restaurant business. We carry books on practically every aspect of human life that is impacted by food. And I got to tell you, that doesn't mean there's very much left over. Americans tend to say, what do I want to make and how can I find a good recipe for it? Uh, uh, traditional Italian home cooking is, what do I have and what can I make from it? Laplace, in one of her books, talks about being out bike riding and she stopped and plucked up arugula, washed the arugula leaves in red wine and had whole grain bread and that was lunch. And I just thought, holy Moses, that is really, you know, that's cooking. Cooking is going to be lost, quite honestly, if people just do recipe following. It's like painting my numbers. It shows how accurately you can measure a quarter teaspoon of this or a half a cup of that. What we're trying to get people to do is think about the ingredients they're using, to learn about the properties of the ingredients. Cookbooks don't have to do anything. You have to do it. The really interesting books that relate to uh, people's experience are the older ones. They're based on the assumption that the writer and the reader, or the cook, are speaking the same language. The great cookbooks like Escoffier, they are basically aid memoir. In the early, mid-19th century, professional cooks and housekeepers began to disappear somewhat from the scene. People who ran households no longer were able to be dependent on those who knew whose mamas had known, whose grandmamas had known. They found themselves in need of cookbooks that told them what to do. That evolved in time into not only here's how you do it, but here's how you do it in a fail-proof way. I, I wouldn't want to lay it on one, one back. It's too great a burden. But uh, if I laid it on anyone, it would probably be Fanny Farmer, who did a book originally called the Boston Cooking School Cookbook, uh, later the Fanny Farmer Cookbook. She was basically offering guarantees by not only putting in a quarter teaspoon of this and a half teaspoon of that, but actually defining those quarter teaspoons and half teaspoons as level. You put, and you put it in your spoon and you took a knife and you leveled it off so that you would have the chemically exact amount. Not allowing, of course, for the fact that ingredients vary tremendously, that cooking conditions, that cooking practices, that it all is different. It's loaded with variability. And in fact, exact cooking by formula is a trap. We didn't carry for a long time in the store. Uh, any Rachel Ray books, partly for the reason that nobody ever asked for them. And then somebody did ask for them. So, oh, I love, I love her. I think she's terrific. So I ordered one copy of each of three of her books. They were certainly nothing that I could get terribly excited about, but they were not disgraceful. They were not, you know, it would not be an embarrassment to put on our shelves. We've barely sold them out yet and that was like a year and a half ago. So it's just not what our customers expect here. Most of the significant chefs in the business have been here at one time or another. The truth is the big guys 
don't usually come here to shop. They practically everybody sends them the books. Alice Waters comes in. I mean, she actually, she, she shops. But what's really more exciting for us is that many, many, many of the major chefs send their people. I can't tell you how many people walk in this door and say, my chef says I should look at books on X, Y, Z. These line cooks and these other people are coming in and it makes great deal more difference to us than if Keller or if, you know, whoever came walking in. For our professional customers, uh, pictures are almost, um, they are required. And it's sort of exciting to watch sometimes two younger cooks standing with a book and poring over the photographs and saying, oh, look how that is done and look how this is done. And what do you think those are? I think those are pea pods. Those are, and occasionally they'll turn to the recipe just to find out what a particular element and it is. A lot of food photography is just awful. A lot of the design of food books with food photography is awful. Thank heavens we are over what I can only call the epidemic of very shallow field of focus. I can show you books in this store that have one eighth of one square inch in focus. It's a cheesy affectation. Uh, it's non-communicative. Uh, I don't know why the photographers feel that they weren't being appreciated, so they had to do something that said, I'm a photographer and I want you to know. I know how my camera works and I know. Instead of saying, I have this instrument that can do wonderful, wonderful things. We have a sort of capacious base. We have not only extra books, our overstock, but we have 3,000 or so used out of print books. You are in what I would call the belly of the beast. This is a cookbook from, by Kate Smith, who in the 1940s was one of the great radio personalities. Creamy grape mallow. Sumptuous frozen fudge sundae, Adirondack snow pudding, and a peanut butter refrigerator dessert. Uh, they don't do them like that anymore. Somebody will come in and say, my mother, when she got married, you know, received the 1954 Fanny Farmer cookbook. And I want one. So we'll go down in our basement and look. If we have it, we have it. She's got it. If if we don't have it, we'll find it for her. Uh, a book for boys called the Jackknife Cookbook. Chapters on the desert island, camping, based on what you can catch, what you can prepare and cook with your jackknife. Any book that is a worthwhile book that we judge to be a book that's made a contribution of some kind, we always keep a last copy as what we call a reference copy. They have a special little do not bring up slip in them. Anybody who wants to look at one of those books, take notes on it, we're not looking to sell or make money from them. They're very, very important for what we are and people know us for it. And I'd be foolish and naive to say that I didn't think that it didn't contribute to the business as well. That's the kind of thing that gives you a reputation where people can say they know. I suppose it would behoove me to have, you know, sort of a reserve answer for that. One book I would surely name, sadly, a book that's no longer available. It's not rare, but it's not in print anymore. Uh, is a book called Green on Greens by Bert Green. And it's a book on uh, every kind of vegetable with wonderful, wonderful personal profiles of these boys. You're looking up zucchini and he starts talking about his mother. Barnes and Noble, about 
six or seven years ago, opened a branch uh, just a few blocks away. And they announced that it was going to be a cooking bookstore. Their market research had indicated that this was a great neighborhood for cookbooks. When they opened, their shelves were filled with, I went in, it was really impressive. They had tremendous range. Three or four months later, uh, it had been depraded because everything that hadn't sold in the first three months had been returned. They didn't have people who worked there who could provide useful information. We just beat the crap out of them and they gave it up. I'm not saying you can't have a big, very, very successful business doing that, but they can't beat love. <laughs> so.